So let's get started. Um, welcome. Thank you for uh, coming to uh, reInvent to Las Vegas. And uh, thanks for coming to this, uh, this session. My name is Glenn Dierkes. I am a software engineer with the AWS Developer Resources Group. And I am joined today by uh, Bob Kinney. Um, he is also a software engineer in the AWS uh, Developer Resources Group. And Bob and I worked on the AWS mobile SDKs. And that's what this session is about, is using those SDKs. And uh, we believe those SDKs can help you build that next great app. So let's, let's dive in. So our, our, um, our agenda for today is to do an overview of the SDKs to give you, um, you know, a background and a foundational understanding of what the SDKs are. Um, and then to jump into some mobile use cases, to some common use cases. And we're going to be doing some demos there and showing some code and talking about that. And then finally, we'll be talking about managing credentials in a uh, mobile environment. If you're familiar with AWS, you know that you have to have credentials to make calls. You know, you have to sign requests to, to use the services. And uh, using them in a mobile environment is a, it's a little bit different. And so we're going to talk about how you can use them in that environment. Um, one thing I'd like to ask is that um, if you have any questions, you save them until the end of the conference, um, end of the session. Uh, we'll have some time there. And if we don't have time to get to all the questions, I'm going to be giving details on how you can get your questions answered um, anyway. Um, also, throughout the, throughout the presentation, there's going to be a number of links, um, like you see on the screen now. And I'm going to have a number of links throughout the session. Um, if you don't get the slide deck, but you still want to get to the content, one thing is that if you remember that first link that's highlighted uh, at the top, that aws.amazon.com slash mobile, that is the portal or landing page for mobile. And from that, that page, you can get to the rest of the content and all of the information that we present in this, uh, in this session. So to start off with, you know, what are the mobile SDKs? Um, and, and these, what we want to do in this session is answer these, these questions about our SDKs. You know, what the mobile SDKs are, who should be using them, what services they support, how they integrate into your, into your mobile applications, how you can get help using them, and where the source is. Um, our mobile SDKs are an open source project, so you can, get, you can see the full source and contribute if you'd like. Um, our hope is that by the end of this session, that you understand how you know, our AWS mobile SDKs can help you build uh, mobile apps. So to start, what are the mobile SDKs? So the point of them is to simplify mobile to cloud development. Um, they're, they're best suited for a thick client architecture. And I'll be talking about that a little bit, a little bit later, about what, what we mean by thick client architecture. And specifically for when we say mobile SDKs, we're talking about two distinct SDKs. One for iOS, which we call the AWS SDK for iOS, and one for Android, the AWS SDK for Android. For iOS, we support version 4.3 and above. And for Android, we support version 2.2, or API level 8 and above. Um, but one of, the, one of the big points with the mobile SDKs is it can help you build a connected mobile application without a middle tier. So who should use the mobile SDKs? So, so as I mentioned before, um, they're best suited for a thick client architecture or thick client applications. And um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in the next slide, but it's for you know, applications that don't want to manage a back end or you know, where you want your users making direct uh, calls to the cloud or where back end processing isn't necessary. You don't have any you know, big data transactions that you have to do or anything of that sort. Then, then our mobile SDKs really help in those, in those uh, type of applications. But with the number of services that we support, and with AWS as your back end, your, you know, your mobile possibilities are really limitless. So, so a little bit more detail about thick client architecture. I, on, on this slide, you can see that I have a representation of thin and thick client architectures. On the left-hand side, I have thin. On the right-hand side, thick. And in a thick client architecture, your devices or your, um, you know, your mobile applications are connecting directly to AWS. Um, they're not going through any proxy, as you see that on the, on the thin client uh, on the thin client side. 
what happens in that normal environment is you, you, you usually set up a, a, a server or some kind of proxy that the clients or the applications will connect to, and then those, that application server will then connect to AWS to get any data or to do any processes it, it needs and then return the data back to the client. So the nice thing with a thick client architecture is that there's no back end. It, it kind of simplifies um, your app development. Um, and with AWS, as, as that back end, you can support millions of customers right out of the box. So it's, you know, it, the AWS mobile SDKs with thick client architecture help you build, you know, internet scale apps without that back end responsibility. So this is a, a list of the services we support um, within the mobile SDKs. Uh, we support 11 services, and, and you can see them there. And um, there's a number of, you know, we have some of the big data services like S3 and DynamoDB, as well as some, you know, control plane type of services like EC2 and elastic load balancing. So you have a wide spectrum of different services that we support to, to give you a variety of different apps that you can, you can build. Um, so, you know, with lots of services means many options. O also, as the services evolve and change and add new APIs and features, we, we update and modify the, the SDKs. So they are kept up to date with those services. So as, you know, S3 introduces a new, a new feature, the, the SDKs are updated uh, correspondingly to give you access to those new features. So... Integrating the mobile SDKs into your application, and we're going to see a little bit of this in the demo. Bob will be doing some demos for us, and he'll be showing this. But for each of them, we try to make the integration as simple as possible. So for iOS, we 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 build a um, a single framework that you just add to your you know your Xcode project or your you know, iOS project, and that gives you access to all of the um, the SDKs and the services that uh, all of the services the SDK uh, supports. So all the functionality. So it's very easy to add, you know, the iOS SDK to your to your project. And the same for Android. We we offer a single jar that you can integrate into your um, you know your Android project, and that again gives you access to all of the services. And so our, our goal here is to keep this as easy and as non-intrusive as possible to you know to use our SDKs within your project. So next, you know, what kind of impact do our SDKs have on your application? So specifically, um, in, in iOS, um, since, since Objective-C is statically linked, only the parts of the SDK that you actually use in your application are included in your final app. So if you were to download our um, iOS SDK you would, and you would look at the framework, you would see that it's 70 megabytes. And, and your first thought might be, you know, I, I don't want a 70 megabyte application. Well, that's not going to happen. Um, depending on what you use from the SDK, you might only add you know, a megabyte or so. Or, or even less, and, and we'll see that in the demo that you can be using S3 and it doesn't bloat your application. And with Android, all of our, um, we have samples and our SDK comes with the default ProGuard integration to help you minimize the overall size of your app will be using our, our SDKs. So our, our SDKs won't blow your, bloat your application and we try to make sure that it's as small as possible. So next, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some different um, some use cases, and we're going to be showing some demos um, th that you might run into in your mobile applications and how they can be solved by using certain services. So one of the things that we include with our SDKs are a number of different uh, samples and articles that, that show you, that give you best practices and, and, and explain how you can use the service within an iOS or Android application and give you code to get you started and explain how to use it. Um, and as you can see, that we have a link up there, and that's an article and a sample for S3. Um, and we're gonna be showing that shortly. But our hope is that you know, we provide a number of samples and that our samples can help you jumpstart your, um, you know, creating your mobile applications. So next, Bob is going to uh, give us a demo of S3. All right, am I on? Yes, I am, great. All right, um, so the first thing we're gonna do is uh, we've brought up Xcode, which is our iOS uh, emulator, 
And um, the first thing I'm going to do is run our application so we can see what an end user will actually see inside of our app. It's a very simple application. It's only got two buttons. So I'm going to first click this one to select an image. And when I select this image, the application uploads the image to S3 and then shows a, a, a dialog saying that my upload is completed. Then if I clicked our second button, our image is now displayed inside of our, our, our view controller. I can go back. I can select the second image. I can click our button again, and our image is changed. So now if we take a look at our actual application, I'd like to highlight a couple of things. First thing I'd like to highlight is the single framework that Glenn mentioned earlier. So this is the one framework that you'll download as part of the SDK, and that's all that's necessary to drop in in your application to enable use of all of those 11 services that the iOS SDK supports. Then inside of our code, <clears throat> first thing we'll look at is the image picker delegate. So this is, what hap this is the, uh, the method or selector that's called after we've uh, selected an image from the image picker. And the first thing we need to do is create a low-level service client. And this is a pattern you'll see in both of the SDKs, and in truth, most uh, all of our SDKs, uh, where we create a low-level service client. And this client will be used to, to uh, execute operations on the individual service. So we provide a, an access and secret key to create that client, and then we call create bucket. Now, this is not an operation you would need to do every single time you ran this application. We're just including it for sake of completeness. Then I get my image data, and I create an S3 put object request. And I use that image data as the data for my object that I'm going to store in S3. I, I then simply call S3 put object, and then show the alert after the, the upload is completed. Now, in this example that we're showing today, we're actually using a synchronous mode of operation of the SDK. But in our downloads available uh, on the website today, we use best practices for doing asynchronous calls using delegates, Grand Central Dispatch, and also background threads. Then for our second portion, we have another uh, S3 client. Our, our samples that are available with the SDK will reuse the client, but in this case, we're just creating one for, for uh, ease of use. And then we create an S3 get object request. Once we get the response from that get object call to S3, we just simply add our image data to our image view. Then finally, just want to highlight that our in Finder, that our application is only 1.2 megs. So as Glenn mentioned earlier, the entire SDK is 70 megs in, in size. So clearly, we're not using all of the, all of the uh, binary code that's available in the framework. Uh, we're we're going to take questions at the end, if you don't mind. Okay. Thanks. That's great. So next, I just wanted to um, just highlight the code that Bob just reviewed, and then contrast that with the um, the Android, or just show the equivalent code in Android, and that it's you know it's it's, it's pretty much the you know the same level of coding um, in either environment. And so you can see the first line is showing that creation of the client, the S3 client. Um, and that's a pattern. For any service that you use with our SDKs, you'll have to create a client first. <clears throat> and so you'll, you'll see that when we show some other code as well. Um, once you have that client, you can then execute any, um, any you know, operation against the service. So you can see that in the next line where you see the, the, uh, the creating of an S3 bucket. Uh, and again, a single line of code you know, using the client, and you just create the bucket, you give it the name you want to create. <clears throat> now, the way S3 works is um, you don't need to create a bucket each time you want to put data into, into the bucket. You would create the bucket once, and then you would upload objects, and then you could download from, from there. Um, just for sake of completeness, we're just showing the, you know, the full creation here. Um, the next line shows putting objects into, the, uh, into that bucket. And again, it's, you know, it's very simple to put data up now into the cloud. You can see it's just a few lines of code. Um, you give it the, the bucket name, the object name, and, and the data you want to store. And then if you want to retrieve that, that's the final line of code. You can see that 
you know, you just create a get object request with, you know, with the name of the bucket you want to retrieve the object from and the name of the object and you get back the data. And you can see that for iOS and Android, it's very similar and, and very simple to do that. <clears throat> and one of the things, you know, one of the reasons for this is that the SDKs, there's a lot going under the covers that's happening. The SDK is, you know, marshalling the request, it's unmarshalling the response, it's signing the request, it's handling any errors and, we're, you know, we'll give you back an exception or an error. If, if it runs into a problem, we'll do automatic retry. So the SDKs are doing a lot for you and trying to simplify the work that you would need to do. So you can focus more on your application and business logic rather than, you know, integrating and, and connect, you know, communicating with the cloud. So <clears throat> another, um, another sample that we include with the SDKs is called our message board sample. And what that highlights is um, Amazon SQS and Amazon SNS, which are the simple queue service and simple notification service. And that, that enables for setting up of queues where you can, you can have um, you know, messages put into the queue and then they're, you know, it acts as a, you know, as a queue in the cloud. And for, for the notification service, you can subscribe people and they can receive notifications via you know, a, a text message or an email, or they can, you can actually even connect a queue to, um, to notifications to a topic. You would create a topic and then you send messages to that topic. And then anybody, anybody who subscribed to that topic would receive those notifications. And so we have a sample, at the, um, we're not gonna demo it, but if you were to download the SDKs, you could, you could try it out. Um, and we have an article that goes along with it that details the code and it shows how you can run the sample and how it's communicating and working with the different services to implement this application. <coughs> but next, I wanted to talk about another, another sample. We include, we have a lot of samples in our, on, in our SDKs. We have eight, I believe, in, um, in total. And, and it, they use various services and, and try to show the services in, 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 different, um, in different lights so you, you can understand how you can use uh, the various services for your application. But another, another service we support is the Amazon SES service or the uh, simple email service. Um, and this allows you to send email from your application without having to interface with the, you know, with, without having to interface with your, the mail app. So, if the, you know, you don't have to leave your application and go to the mail, um, the mail application on the phone to, for the user to send an email. Instead, you can just send email behind the scenes and this, this could be good for, you know, sending feedback to you or, you know, capturing errors or, or things of that sort. And we have an, uh, you know, an article and a demo that goes, uh, a sample that goes with that and we're going to, uh, Bob's going to actually uh, uh, walk us through that. There you go. I got it. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this time we're going to do uh, an Android sample. So I've uh, loaded up. Eclipse, which is a popular IDE for Android development. And I'll go ahead and start up the application so we can, once again, see what an end user would actually see. It's a very simple application. It's a simple one text field and a submit button at the bottom. So I'll go ahead and type in a message and then click submit. And I get a feedback that our message has been sent and recorded. So while I'm waiting for that to actually end up in our assigned inbox, we'll take a little tour around our Eclipse project. Um, I just wanna highlight once again uh, that we have a single, single file that we need to add to our, to our project, which is the AWS Android SDK.jar. So this is the bundled jar that contains uh, code for all of the supported services. Uh, if you don't want to do that, we also have the individual service jars that Glenn mentioned earlier. So all of our logic is inside of this feedback form demo activity. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this application actually uses async task, which is a common method for creating background tasks in, in Android applications. And so in our background thread, we once again create a, a low level client, which in this case is going to be our simple email client, simple email service client. Again, using providing our access key and secret key. We have a helper method for creating our message. 
and then create a send message request using our pre-authorized, uh, our pre-whitelisted email address. Then we call ses.sendemail, and our message is off, and will be received by our uh, email client. And then here, down here, just our helper method, which just creates the content with a standard uh, subject, and then the content, the body content that was supplied by the end user. And then before we actually go and check our inbox, I'm actually just going to start one more thing. I'm going to export our application as an APK. And what this will do is actually use our ProGuard integration that Glenn mentioned earlier. We ship with a standard ProGuard uh, or a default ProGuard config that will actually allow you to use the Android SDK and generate the smallest possible APK. So while that export is running, now we'll switch over to our browser. And now we have our message. So you'll notice here that it says me. That's because for our sample application, we use the same address from, for our from and to address. So this is, allows us to get around the sandboxing rules for SES. And we can see inside that our message that I typed in in our application is uh, displayed. So if I switch back to Eclipse, I can see my export has now completed. So now I'll switch to the Finder, browse to where we exported our APK, and we can see it's only 498 kilobytes. And then if we, excuse me, explore down to where our application project is and look at our libs directory, you can see that the jar is 3.8 megs. Now this is obviously a compressed uh, Java jar already. Um, but we can clearly see that we're not, again, using uh, all of this, uh, this bytecode um, inside of our APK. Great. Thanks, Bob. Okay. So just to, um, to review again and just show you again that, you know, the, the similarities of um, the Android code to, to iOS, so I have them side by side again. Um, and again, you see the same pattern. Um, to use SES, you, you have to first create a client. Um, and again, one, one line of code, not that complicated. Um, and that, but that's the same similar pattern that you, know, you do for S3 and you would do for any of the services we, uh, we support in the SDKs. Um, next, if you want to send them a message, you know, an email message can, be, you know, can have a lot of data and can have a lot of content. So we just show that as a utility method, but once you create that message, you will have a message object in each of the SDKs. And in the, in the final block of code, you can see you know, how you would actually send it. So you just set up the destination, the to and from, you create a, a send request and, and you submit it to, uh, to SES. So again, a few lines of code and your, your applications can be sending um, emails. So next, um, another sample, uh, actually in this, in this case we have a couple of different samples that we provide in the SDKs, uh, is to support um, Amazon DynamoDB. Um, Amazon DynamoDB is a, is a NoSQL database. And with that actual service, we, we have two types of interfaces in each of the SDKs. We have what we call our low level um, interface, which is a one-to-one -one mapping of the, of the, um, of the operations uh, available to you by the service. So Amazon, um, you know, DynamoDB has create table, uh, list tables, uh, put item, get item operations. So you'll see those same operations in the low-level SDK um, um, service um, that we provide, the low-level interface that we provide in each of the SDKs. But for each of the, um, each of the environments, for the iOS SDK, we have a high-level interface that we call the AWS Persistent Framework for Core Data. So it's a core data implementation that, that um, allows you to use core data and then goes to uh, and stores your data in DynamoDB. And for Android, we have a DynamoDB mapper that allows you, again, to work in a, like at an object level. Instead of working at a functional level, you can work at an object level to then store your data in, in DynamoDB. So for each of these different interfaces, we have a, a sample and an article that details um, some code and, and an application that you could, you, know, you could use to jumpstart your own development and, and gives us specifics on, on how it works. Um, also, I'd, I'd like to mention is that tomorrow, uh, Bob is going to be giving a talk specifically about the two high-level um, interfaces and going into a lot more detail of how they work and how you can use them 
and doing some demos there as well. So if you wanna, if you wanna learn more about those interfaces in DynamoDB, you can go to that talk, which is tomorrow. Okay, next, I, I just wanna mention, I just wanted to talk about managing credentials. So, so as you saw through our, our, our samples, to, to, make, you know, to make these requests against the services, you have to have these credentials, uh, an access key and a secret key. And in, in a mobile environment, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a different environment because you, the, the, um, the application is actually running in the user's hands. So one of the things is, you know, how do you get the, the credentials in, you, into the device? So one thing is you don't want to embed your root credentials into your application code and then deliver that as, uh, as your application. Um, if it were to get compromised, if the, um, if the keys were to be extracted, your, your entire AWS account would be accessible. And, and it, is, it is easy for information to be extracted from applications, so that's, that's not a recommended practice. So, so one thought, if you're familiar with AWS, you, you may know about um, IAM accounts. And what that is, it's essentially like a sub-account from your, your main root uh, account. And what, one thing you can do in there is you can set up uh, permissions and you can limit the scope of that account. So I'm showing a, a policy um, in, in this slide that it effectively says, you know, it's going to allow um, a, the user to put objects into S3 and get objects from S3, but only in a specific bucket, in, in a bucket, you know, an S3 bucket called my bucket. And so you can put these, these, uh, this policy onto the IAM account, and that would limit the scope of what that account can do. So it, that account would not be able to call EC2 or Dynamo or do anything else, would not be able to create new buckets. It could only be able to do these operations on that bucket. And you might think that you can embed these credentials into your application, but again, this has, this has a problem as well. First off, you can't rotate the credentials. Once it's in the app, if you were to rotate the credentials, that app would no longer function because it's now using credentials that are no longer valid. And then secondly, um, there's no individual user control. So the problem there is if you find somebody's being malicious with your app, you can't just specifically turn them off. You'd have to turn off the entire app so that that's not, um, it's still too limited. So obviously, what should you do? Um, so one thing what we've done is we've created what we call a token vending machine, which is a, um, which we provide as a sample reference application. And what this helps you do is to get temporary um, time limited uh, credentials into, into applications. And so the way this works is your device, your application would, you know, connect to the TVM, the TVM would authenticate it and then send back the temporary credentials to the device that it would then use to make calls against AWS. And then those, those temporary credentials you know, would only last from one to 36 hours and would again be limited, like I was showing in the, um, the IM use case, the, the slide before. So that, that would limit you know, what, the, what they would do. But this is a reference application that you know, we, we, pro we provide the code and documentation on how you can run it and um, update it to meet your application needs. Um, and then this is a way that your apps could connect to to get credentials in, in a more, secu uh, more secure uh, method. Um, so to summarize, you know, don't embed credentials into your application. We have some art articles and, and, and documents discussing how the TVM works and, and why you want to use that instead of embedding your credentials. And also, we provide a full um, application that uses a custom TVM. It takes the, you know, the, the, the the code that we provide and then customizes it for a specific application that we show. And we're gonna actually demo that uh, shortly, but it would, it would walk you through both an iOS and an Android case of how you could do that for an application. So we're gonna, we're gonna demo that now. Scratchy beard is scratchy. Okay, um, so we'll once again, uh, load up our uh, Xcode, because uh, our sample application is- You gotta uh, hit the switch. Oh, am I? Okay, sorry, thank you. Sorry about that. All right, so we're gonna load up again uh, Xcode, because our sample application is an iOS application. And we'll go ahead and start up the simulator. First, we'll stop our other application. We'll start up our simulator. And it's 
once again, very simple application with a login button. Now we've gone ahead and pre-populated this, uh, this TVM with a couple different users for, for demonstration purposes. So the first thing I'll do is log in as the user Vegas1. And now I have another button for listing Vegas1's objects. So when I click on that button, I get a list of two objects, my first object and my second object. Now if I go back and log out, and now log in as a separate user, Vegas2. And one thing to note about our, our, our samples that use the TVM, we have uh, best practices for storing the temporary credentials that are generated in the uh, keychain for iOS and also the user preferences for the Android application so that the, uh, the application doesn't have to refresh them constantly. So now that I've logged in as Vegas2, I can click this button again and now I get a different listing. So I have my object number three and my object number four. Now if I switch over to my AWS console and we look at our reInvent personal file store bucket, okay? So this is a bucket that we've cordoned off for this application. Inside of our bucket, we have two virtual folders, Vegas1 and Vegas2, that are associated with our individual users. So if I click on Vegas1's folder, I see the two objects that I saw when I was logged in as Vegas1. If I go back to Vegas2, I see the two objects that are in my application right now. Now if I click Add and add an additional test object, it will show up in my listing inside of the application. And if I switch to the console and hit refresh, our object shows up here as well. Now obviously our application is, is doing, some, uh, some, doing some logic to make sure that we're only showing the, the folder, the virtual folder associated with the logged in user. But we've also done is make sure that even if the credentials were leaked from this application, that the, the impact is that they would only have access to those logged in users objects. And I'll now give it back to Glenn to actually talk about how we implemented that. Thanks, Bob. So as Bob was mentioning, the um, the, the way that magic happens is, again, is, in a, is a policy um, that's applied to the credentials. So when the TVM, when, the, when a user logged in, when Vegas1 was logging in, um, and, the, and the credentials were be, being generated for that user and being sent back, a policy was, was um, applied to the credentials to limit what, you know, to specify exactly what those credentials could do. And, and that policy is listed here. Um, so again, you can see, if you look at the, there's two statements, um, so two actions that the, uh, that the credentials have. So if you look at the first one, it's allowing put, get, and delete object on a particular uh, resource, which is S3, and it's that reinvent personal file store bucket that Bob was just highlighting. Um, and then it has this username string. Now the TVM, what it's doing is it's substituting the username that was logged in. So Vegas1 was logged in and was substituted for username here. Um, so that's why when you look in the console, you saw those, um, the two subfolders, Vegas1 and Vegas2. Um, because those were substituted in. So Vegas 1 could only put, get, and delete objects within that subfolder. Um, and when Vegas 2 logs in, he can only do it for his, his username. The second statement is allowing, is allowing the user to, to, list, um, to list the bucket, to list the objects within that bucket. But again, it's saying it can only do it on the, on the one particular bucket, the reinvent personal file store bucket and it has to be prefixed with the username. So that limits it again to that, to that subfolder. So as Bob was mentioning, if, if the credentials were still extracted from the, uh, the mobile application, um, they would only be able to access that single bucket and only those, you know, only those operations. So um, you would not be able to start EC2 instances, you would not be able to access DynamoDB, you would not be able to create additional buckets or any, anything of that sort. So that's, that's the way the, the uh, token vending machine can, um, can limit what you can do. And, and the way the token vending machine does that is it uses um, a service called um, STS or the secure token service to create these temporary credentials and apply a policy to it. Glenn, you mentioned the fact that they're temporary. Yeah. Um, so one other thing that, uh, with, with that is those credentials are temporary and that they, um, you can specify how long they're, they're good for. So you can, you can specify that they're only good for one to 36 hours. Um, and then that allows you with the token vending machine to, if you find a user is being malicious, you can then 
not authenticate them through the TVM anymore, and then they wouldn't be able to get new credentials. So I just wanted to um, so just summarize some data and, and give some other resources that you can use. Um, so again, if you, if you are able to get a copy of the slides, um, this slide provides links to all the documentation for the various services that, the, um, that our SDKs support. Um, but more importantly, if you wanted to, to get help with the SDKs, um, if you ran into a problem or if you wanted to learn, you know, learn more about them, you can, uh, we have a forum. Um, and if you check out the forum, it's, uh, the one listed here is for the mobile forum. You'll see that, that we're active on that. We try to answer uh, questions and be responsive um, and help our customers. So that's one way to get help. Um, and then also, as, as, you, as you've seen through this session, we have the SDKs contain a number of samples and articles. And, and we hope those samples can help jumpstart um, your application development for, you know, for whatever mobile app you're trying to build and whatever platform. And next, I, I just wanted to, to mention that we just launched a, um, a mobile blog about a couple weeks ago, and we're going to be you know, announcing release updates and additional information about the, uh, about the SDKs. Um, and in fact, just this week, we did a, a, a blog post about managing credentials in a mobile environment, and it has a number of links um, and data you know, and information for you know, how, to, how to get started with the TVM, how to write policies, and, and, and things of that sort. So, um, so don't hesitate to get onto the, you know, on, onto the forums and ask us a question. We're, you know, we are here to help you. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, the source is, is, is available. We consider this an open source project, and it's available on GitHub. Anytime that we, uh, we make a release, we update the GitHub uh, repository. And so I, I provide those links here. But also, um, with the, with the source, we provide a build script. So you can build the, the SDKs yourself if you, you know, if, you, if you find that to be necessary. If you want to run um, an, an older version of iOS or there's something, there's something you'd want to change or you find an, an, an issue, you can, you can build the SDK yourself. And if you do find an issue, don't hesitate to, you know, to fork our repository and submit a pull request. Um, we've gotten some requests and we've incorporated them into the SDK. So we're happy to get feedback and, and help make the SDK better for everybody. Um, also, on the, on the mobile blog, um, we, just, we also have some blog posts on how, actually it, it steps you through how to build both SDKs. So that can help you get started if, if you want to build your, the SDKs yourself. So that's our, our session for today. Um, uh, thank you for your, your time and attention. We, we really uh, look forward to getting feedback about the talk. And so, you know, learning more about how we can do this talk better and, and you know, what was good and what wasn't. Um, also, if so, if you can fill out an evaluation form, that would be great. Otherwise, um, if you tweet, you can tweet to hashtag reinvent any feedback. Um, but we do have some time now to... to